it's Mrs. M. I wanted to provide you this reading resource because I'm aware that not every student has um, has got their Night Diary novel. And I do want everyone to be able to keep up with the assignments, uh, especially with this new online platform that we're having to use. Um, this is not a mandatory video. You don't have to watch this. You don't have to listen to me read. I wanted to provide it though for my students that didn't have the novel or if you just want to listen to me read and ask the questions and give additional thoughts to go along with the reading, it might be helpful. Um, so today in this video, I'm going to read the diary entries of July 14th, 1947 through July 21st, 1947. This is what's due Monday, March 23rd on Manage Back. Um, those instructions are included on the Manage Back task. That is on for Wednesday, March 18th. Um, before we start reading, I want you to take a look at the front cover of the novel, and I want you to pay attention to the illustration that Vera Heeren and Donnie chose to include for this novel. I want you to jot down for your own purposes not to be turned in, but what do you see on the front cover? What do you think about the illustration on the front cover? And what do you wonder about the illustration? And then I want you to restart the video and read, or listen to me read, excuse me. Okay, let's get started. All right. July 14th, 1947. Dear Mama, I know you know what happened today at 6 a.m. 12 years ago. How could you not? It was the day we came and you left. But I don't want to be sad today. I want to be happy and tell you everything. I'll start at the beginning. You probably already know what I'm telling you, but maybe you don't. Maybe you haven't been watching. I like turning 12 so much already. It's the biggest number I've ever been, but it's an easy number, easy to say, easy to count, easy to split in half. I wonder if Emil thinks about you on this day like I do. I wonder if he likes being 12. Oh, my video just blacked out. Sorry. We woke up at a little before seven. Emil and I usually sleep through our birth minutes, and then when we wake up, we stand next to the last mark we etched into the wall with a sharp rock. No one else knows it's there. I do it for Emil, and he does mine, and then we compare how much we've grown since last year. Emil has finally caught up with me. Papa says someday Emil will tower over all of us. That's hard to imagine. Now, I want you to think, what are the two significant events that our main character is talking about here at the in the very first paragraph? So go back and decide what two significant events is she talking about. And there is text evidence to support that. Okay, let's move on to page two. Papa gave me your gold chain with a small ruby stone hanging from it. He started giving me the jewelry when I was seven. Now I have two gold bangles, two gold rings, small emerald and gold hoop earrings, and the ruby necklace. Papa said I should save the jewelry for special occasions, but lately there are none. So I'll wear all the jewelry at once and never take it off. I don't know where he keeps all of it, but each year on my birthday, another piece appears at my bedside in a dark blue velvet box with gold trim. When you open it, the blue satin lining winks back at you. Papa always asks for the box back after I take out the jewelry. Secretly, I want the box more than the jewelry. I want it to be all mine and never have to give it back. I could find any old thing, a pebble, a leaf, a pistachio shell, and put it in the box. Like magic, these things would get to be special, at least for a date. We have stop that. Maybe he'll let me have it when your jewelry runs out. I want to tell you about this diary I'm writing in. Cosie gave it to me this morning, wrapped in brown paper, tied with a piece of dried grass. He never gives me gifts on my birthday. I once read an English story where a little girl got a big pink cake and presents wrapped in shiny paper and bows for her birthday. I thought about the little gifts Cosie gives us all the time. Pieces of candy under our pillows, or a ripe tomato from the garden, sliced, salted, and sprinkled with chili pepper on a plate. Cakes and bows must be nice, but is anything better than a perfect tomato? Ooh, I don't like tomatoes. But if you like tomatoes, I think it would be a really good idea and was something that I was gonna possibly do in class, is have us get some sliced tomatoes, salted, 
sprinkle it with chili pepper. So if that sounds appetizing, fix it and write about your experience. Tell me about it, okay? The diary is covered in purple and red silk, decorated with small sequins and bits of mirrored glass sewn in. The paper is rough, thick, and the color of butter. It is not lined, which I like. I've never had a diary before. What? When Cosy gave it to me, he said it was time to start writing things down and that I was the one to do it. He said someone needs to make a record of the things that will happen because the grown-ups will be too busy. I'm not sure what he thinks is going to happen, but I've decided I'm going to write in it every day if I can. I want to explain things to you as if I'm writing a storybook, like the Jungle Book except without all the animals. I want to make it real so you can imagine it. I want to remember that every, what everyone says and does, and I won't know the ending until I get there. Cosy also gave Emil five charcoal drawing pencils. Five! He also made us rice care with our puris. Page four. I'm not sure there is anything better tasting in the world. Emil, who normally eats too fast, makes his pudding last extra long, eating the smallest bites he can. I think he just does it so I have to watch him long after I'm finished. Every so often he'll look up and smile. I pretend I don't care. Sometimes he saves his sweets for me, but not rice kier. Today we were running late though, and Emil couldn't spend forever eating his kier because Daddy took our plates away and told us to get ready. Emil started grumbling about school and how he wished he was a grown-up and could work at the hospital like Papa instead. The drums sound better at a distance, Dotty said, like she always does, and rushed us out the door. Here's another secret. And don't be mad. Emil and I didn't go to school. We headed all the way out of town to the sugarcane field and tried to walk through it like a maze. We broke off pieces to chew. Later, we stopped under a shady tree. Emil found bugs to draw, and I read. After we bought potato pecoras at the roadside cart in town, hoping no one would ask why we weren't in school. The pecoras tasted crisp and extra salty. Emil thinks they're too salty. Sorry, it went off again. Emil thinks they're too salty, but I like the sting on my tongue that stays long after I've finished eating. Emil would rather draw and play all day instead of going to school. He would rather do anything besides school. He draws very well. Did you know that? I don't hate school but I didn't want Emil to be alone on our birthday. When Papa finds out we didn't go to school, he'll be much angrier at Emil than he will at me. That's how it is with Papa and Emil. It hasn't always been like that. Emil used to be Papa's favorite. I think because Emil was always louder, happier, and funnier than I am. But now, because Emil isn't small and cute, Papa is different. When we were about seven or eight, Emil ran away. That's when it started. Papa came home from a long day at the hospital, and during dinner, he told Emil to stop smiling so much that it made him look ridiculous. This only made Emil smile more. Then Papa said, Emil, you can't read. You play around too much and draw little pictures. You must be more serious or you will become nothing. Maybe I should leave. Then you'll be happy, Emil said. He waited for Papa to say something, but Papa didn't. He just turned back to his food. Emil got up and walked straight out of the house. Page six. An hour went by and he didn't come back. So I went out to look for him. I looked everywhere, around the garden, the shed, Kazi's and Mahit's cottages, all the places he might go. I even looked in the pantry and in Papa's closet. Papa acted like nothing was happening, but I told Kazi that I couldn't find Emil anywhere and he told Dottie and Dottie told Papa, so Papa went out with a lantern. I stayed awake in my bed wondering what I would do if Emil never came back. I couldn't imagine being in this house, in this life, without him. I heard Papa return and I waited to hear Emil's voice or his footsteps. But I didn't hear anything and began to cry, holding my doll, Dee, tight. At some point, I fell asleep. When I woke at first light, Emil slept loud, soundly in his bed next to mine. I wasn't sure if I had dreamed the whole thing. Emil, I said, poking him awake, standing over him. Where did you go? Does Papa know you're back? Papa knows I'm back, Emil said in a dull voice. I walked into town, but then I kept going. I didn't want to stop. 
but Papa found me. Is Papa mad? I asked. Papa will always be mad at me. It doesn't matter if I smile or don't smile. I'm just not what he wanted. That's not true, I said, and put my hand on his shoulder. He turned away. He might have been right about Papa, though. Since that night he ran away, Papa always seems angry at Emil for being Emil. I want you to take a minute, go back through the last few pages, make some annotations, okay? Highlight some important details, highlight any figurative language. Uh, Vera here and Donnie is really great about incorporating figurative language to help create the mood and the tone for this novel. Um, so go back, take a minute, do that, and then restart the video. So pause it as you do that, and then restart it. Okay, we're on page seven. Papa left a book on Emil's bed this morning. Normally, on our birthday, he only gives me the jewelry, and we do puja at our temple and offer the gods handfuls of leaves and sweets for a prosperous year. But Papa did not talk about it this morning. Maybe we will go tomorrow. Papa doesn't like to go to temple. We only go on our birthdays and Diwali because Dottie begs us to go. Sometimes Papa walks her there and waits outside for her. I always look forward to going. I drink in the smoky smell of the lamps burning. I even like the metal taste of the holy water on my tongue. The soft sounds of the prayers being chanted and sung make me feel loved, like you're there, watching. But maybe a Hindu temple is the last place you'd be. Emil's look is beautiful. It's a thick collection of tales from the Mahabrahada with gold lettering on the cover and bright, colorful pictures inside. Emil will love the drawings, but he won't read it. Emil says he can't read right because the words jump around and change on him. Papa thinks he's lying so he doesn't have to do his schoolwork, but I know he's not. I see the way he studies the writing. His eyes squinted, his face pinched. I see how hard he tries. He even turns the book upside down sometimes, but he says nothing helps. I think it's because Emil is a little bit magical. His eyes turn everything into art. Maybe Papa thought if he brought him a really good book, Emil would read it. Papa didn't say anything about skipping school today. I hope our headmasters don't send a message, messenger with a note. Now I'm tired and must drink my warm milk and go to bed. Emil is already sound asleep, making little whistling noises through his nose. I've decided that night is the best time to write you. That way, no one will ask me any questions. Love, Nisha. I want to go back to the top of page 8 where it describes Emil and his difficulties with the reading. I want you to think about what could that be? What could that mean? And then I want you to look at that statement that Nisha makes. She says, I think it's because Emil is a little bit magical. I want you to think about her perspective versus Papa's perspective. How he sees Emil's, oh, sorry, I blacked out. Okay. How he sees Emil's reading difficulties and how Nisha sees them. Okay. Look at those opposing perspectives. Okay. And a question that I had about this page is why doesn't Nisha want anybody to ask her questions? Okay. All right. Let's go on. We'll start with July 15th. 1947, page 9. Dear Mama, I only have time to tell you one thing tonight because my eyelids are heavier than wet sheets. Papa is very mad. I knew he would be when he found out. Emil's headmaster sent over a message. Mine did not. When Papa found out, he made Emil sit in the corner with no breakfast this morning. Emil didn't ask why I wasn't being punished, even though Papa must have known I skipped too. I guess the difference is that I do well in school and Emil doesn't. I only ate one of my chapatis and wrapped the other in a napkin. Then I stuck it in my school book for Emil when no one was looking. I think Cozzy likes us best. Papa loves us, of course, because he's our father. And Daddy loves us because she's our grandmother. That's what they're supposed to do. But Papa is too busy to do a lot of liking and Daddy is too old. Papa works every day, even on Sunday. I guess he has to since he's a doctor. People leave gifts on our doorstep all the time, like flowers and sweets for the wonderful things he has done for him, for them. Sometimes I think Papa's not real. 
He leaves early with the cool morning air and never makes a sound. Sometimes when he comes back late at night and kisses me goodnight in my sleep, I wake up and see him. It feels like I'm dreaming. Love, Misha. July 16, 1947. Dear Mama, Causey has so much energy for us. He always has. When we were younger, maybe five or six, he used to sit cross-legged on the floor and play with us after his work was done. I remember he was the first person to teach Emil how to play cricket in the front of the house, how to throw and bat and catch. Papa never did. I would peer out the window and watch them, laughing hard when Emil missed the ball, since he could hardly see me. I help Causey in the kitchen all the time, even though Dottie doesn't want me to. She says I'll marry well and have someone cook for me, just like Causey does for us. But that doesn't sound like any fun at all. I can't wait to be older and do what Causey can do. He lets me help him more all the time. I know how to sort the lentils, grind the spices with his marble mortar and pestle, clarify the butter for ghee, and mix the dough for chapatis. I usually finish my schoolwork fast and sneak into the kitchen when Dottie thinks I'm still working to help Cosy prepare dinner. He sees me even when he's not looking up. It's like he smells me. He turns and holds up a handful of peas to be shelled. I like to cook things even more than I like to eat them. How does Causey take all these plain, boring foods, bitter vegetables, dried lentils, flour, oil, spices, and turn them into something so warm and delicious every time? Love, Nisha. So I want you to compare this to a dish somebody in your family makes. What are the plain, boring foods that are turned into something warm and delicious? I know for me, it was always my grandmother's um, mashed potatoes. So now at my house, I have Mama Joe mashed potatoes. And potatoes are plain and boring, I think. But when Mama Joe makes them the way she does, it makes them so delicious and not just a potato anymore. Think about that. And if you have time, next time your mom is cooking, help her out. Or your dad. Oh, it blanked out again. Or if your dad cooks, help your dad. Okay, July 17th, we're at the top of page 12. Hold on, let me see, sorry, I'm. y'all know I'm not that technical. Is this still recording? I think so. Yes, it's still recording. Okay, sorry, this is definitely an adventure. Mia, sorry. Okay, top of page 12. July 17th, 1947. Dear Mama, Causey is right. I was made for writing in a diary. I'd much rather write than talk. I talk very little, mostly just to Emil and Causey. I feel normal around them. I talk to Dottie and Papa if I have to, but for the rest of the world, the words just don't want to come out. Like part of my mouth or my brain is broken. It feels scary to talk because once the words are out, excuse me, you can't put them back in. But if you write words and they don't come out the way you want them to, you can erase them and start over. I have the neatest handwriting in my class and get the highest marks on all my compositions. You would be very proud of me. So I want you to think about Nisha's statement about how sometimes the words just don't want to come out, like part of her mouth or her brain is broken. And compare that to Sometimes when you're writing, some of us would are much better at expressing ourselves orally than writing something down. Because sometimes it's like we have all the words up here, but transitioning from here onto our paper, there is kind of a block. So I want you to think about that and relate that to Nisha's experience and what she goes through and how she would much rather write than talk. Okay? All right, let's continue. Emil likes to talk. He likes to run. He likes to laugh, he likes to yell, but he hates writing anything down, except for his drawings. The teachers think he's stupid because he can't read and doesn't do his schoolwork, but they should look at his drawings. Emil draws all sorts of things. Sometimes he draws frightening scorpions and snakes with dark charcoal pencil. He draws every leg, every bump, every little detail. Sometimes he draws me early in the morning when I'm still sleeping. It's strange to look at myself that way, but I like it. It makes me feel like I'm not alone, like someone is always watching over me. Are you, Mama? 
Sometimes Emil draws Dottie or Papa when they aren't looking and only shows me. He draws Cosy cooking. He likes to paste lots of paper scraps together with flour and water to make a bigger drawing space. Cosy once gave him a drawing pad. Emil only does his best work on the paper after he practices on his bits of flower bags, ends of newspaper, or whatever he can find. He let me touch the drawing pad paper once. It's cloud white, silky smooth. I wonder why Emil is the way he is. I wonder why I am the way I am. I bet you know. So think about this statement and one of the questions that you need to answer for this reading assignment is what does this mean? So what does Nisha mean by this statement? And up to this point we have plenty of text evidence that um, it ha shows us how these characters are developing. It shows us the differences between Emil and Nisha. What are their strengths and what are their weaknesses? So as you answer the, the two questions, think about those and use them, um, use text evidence to support your answers. Okay, let's uh, move on. Page 14, July 18th, 1947. Dear Mama, something very strange happened today. Three men, oh, it blacked out again. Okay. Three men came to our house this afternoon. I don't know why they came. I was doing my homework. Emil tried to do his, but mostly doodled. Dottie sat at the table writing letters. Papa was at the hospital. The men knocked on the door. One of them was a teacher at our school who always dyes his gray hair red. His beard is the color of a chili pepper. I didn't recognize the other two men. Dottie looked out the window and called Emil. Then she told us both to go into the kitchen with Cosy, so we did. Her eyes darted back and forth before she answered the door. <coughs> All three of us, me, Cosy, and Emil, peeked around the corner. The men spoke so quietly. Sorry, had another screen pop up. The men spoke so quietly I couldn't hear them. Then they spoke louder. I heard bits and pieces of sentences, words and names I had been hearing Papa talk about to Dottie seen in the headlines from their newspapers. I turned over the words like puzzle pieces in my head, wondering how they were supposed to fit together. Pakistan, Jinnah, Independence, Nehru, India, British, Lord Mountbatten, Gandhi, Partition. Dottie nodded and nodded and the air smelled like the smoke from pipes. She tried to close the door once and one of the men, the tallest one, held the door open, not letting her. I held my breath. Then she finally closed the door and turned around. We came out from our hiding places, but she didn't say a thing. Her eyes were big and she and Cosy kept giving each other secret looks. Emil asked what happened. Dottie waved him away, but Emil didn't give up. Tell me or I'll scream, he said. I put my hand over my mouth. I couldn't believe he was being so naughty. Dottie frowned. It was nothing to worry about, she said. And if you scream, she said, wagging her finger angrily at Emil, your papa will be the first to know. Emil's shoulders slumped. Cosy disappeared into the kitchen. I finished my work and helped him clean some green beans and chop the garlic and ginger into the tiniest pieces you ever saw. But Cosy didn't tell me anything, and I could tell he didn't want to. Page 16. The men seemed upset, I said later to Emil when we were lying on our beds. I think something bad is going on. I know, said Emil. I heard them ask when we'd be leaving. Why would we leave, I asked. It has something to do with India being free from the British soon, he said. I wondered what that meant. Me, stop. To be free from the British. Why were they allowed to rule over us in the first place? Didn't they have their own people to worry about? I thought about the men at the door. They seemed calm in that way grown-ups get calm before they get very angry. Remember when Papa used to tickle us? Emil said, turning on his side toward me. He hasn't done that in a long time, I replied. When we were little, Papa would tickle us to wake us up. It's so strange to think about that now. I remember trying to like it since Emil liked it so much. Emil would throw his head back and squeal for more. I would grit my teeth and try not to push Papa's hand away. It made me feel like I was falling off a cliff. I asked Emil why he was thinking about that. Because I wish he was still that way, Emil said, and turned on his back again. 
He closed his eyes and I could hear his breathing slow down. I thought about the old Papa, the one who tickled us. Had Papa changed that much or had we just gotten older? Love, Nisha. Remember, at any time, if you need to pause and annotate, please do that, okay? July 19th, 1947. Dear Mama, more bad things are happening. When Emil and I walk the mile to our schools, we pass lots of things. First, we walk through the rest of our compound where we live, since Papa is the head doctor for the Mir Prakash City Hospital. The government gave us a large place to live in, much bigger than anyone I know. We have our bungalow and a coop for the chickens, the flower and vegetable gardens, and the cottages where Kazi and the groundkeeper Mahit live. I'm on page 18. As we walk closer and closer to town, we pass the hospital. Then we pass the jail where all the people have to go when they do things like steal from the markets. Dottie says it's not a jail for the murderers. The murderers go somewhere else. I always try to catch a prisoner's... Oh, I blacked again. Sorry. I always try to catch a prisoner's eye when I go to school, since I can see them through the fences. I feel bad for them. Usually they stole because they were hungry. But sometimes they are truly bad ones, too. So, But sometimes there are truly bad ones, too, who just want to be bad, who hurt and steal just for fun. I think I can tell who's bad and who's not. The bad ones smile real big. The good ones don't. Our schools are right next to each other. The government school for boys and the government school for girls. Mine is smaller because not all girls go to school, but Papa says it's important to be educated. Today, when we walked to school, two older boys started following us. Sometimes this happens. Sometimes they chase Emil, but usually only to scare him. He runs faster than anyone I know, so he always gets away. This time, though, the boys started throwing rocks at us. A small one hit the back of my head. Emil pulled my arm, and we broke into a run. Emil led us into an alley. We ran through the alley and some gardens, then back onto another dirt road. We found a cluster of mango trees and hid behind them. Why did they do that? What did you do? I whispered at him. Nothing. I didn't do anything, he whispered back at me. I touched the small bump where the rock hit me. We went a different way to school down another dirt road and through the sugar cane, but it took a long time and we were late. After school, we ran all the way home without stopping. When we got home, we stood catching our breath outside the door, so Dottie wouldn't ask why we were out of breath. It's because we're Hindus, Emil said. He looked around and started to whisper again. There are lots of places all over India where the Hindus and Sikhs and Muslims fight one another all the time now. Just not here yet. Kazi tells me what he reads in the papers. That's why those men came to the house yesterday. They said the Hindus should leave, and they don't want Kazi to live with us. Because he's Muslim? I asked. But Emil didn't answer as he ran into the house and to our room where he worked on his drawings until dinner. I thought about those boys. They were Muslim. Everyone knows who is Muslim, Hindu, or Sikh by the clothes they wear or the names they have. But we all have lived together in this town for so long. I just never thought much about people's religions before. Does it have to do with India becoming independent from the British? I don't see how those things go together, how those two things go together. I want y'all to remember too, Nisha and Emil are 12 years old. So some of you are 11, some of you are 12. So I want you to think about the perspective that you have even right now as we're going through our current situation here in the United States and even place other places around the world, okay? Sometimes Emil knows things that I don't. He talks to people more and goes to the market with Kazi. He has lots of friends at school. He doesn't mind if his words come out right or not. I wish I were more like Emil. I don't have any friends except Sabine. All the kids play together at my school, no matter what religion we are. Sabine is Muslim, and she and I always have lunch together. She doesn't have many friends because she doesn't stop talking and never listens. I don't mind. I'm a good listener. Nobody ever mentions the fact that you were Muslim. M uh, Mama, it's like everyone forgot. But I don't want to forget. The truest truth is that I don't know any other children whose parents are different religions. It must be a strange thing that nobody wants to talk about. 
I guess we're Hindu because Papa and Daddy are. But you're still a part of me, Mama. Where does that part go? Love, Nisha. Ah, it blacked out again. Sorry. I don't know if it blacks out on just my screen or y'all's screen too, but I'm sorry. Okay, July 20th, 1947. Dear Mama, I've been thinking about you a lot lately. I always do around my birthday. Papa told us once that came out the right way, but a meal came out the wrong way. Hit feet first. A male once asked Dottie if he was the reason you died. Dottie told him to stop thinking such awful things and close his mouth. But I wonder it too. I hope Emil doesn't think about it too much. There is one large picture of you that Papa keeps on his bookshelf with a garland draped over it. Your hair is pulled back into a bun and you have coal liner on your eyes. You look like a movie star. Emil looks like you with his long nose and wide eyes. I look more like Papa. I have his round face and small mouth. But I wished I looked more like you, Mama. Sometimes the sadness about you being gone comes and finds me after not being there for a while. Sometimes makes me think about you, and then I get sad for a long time. Dottie never kisses me. She only pats my hand. She braids my hair and gives me cardamom milk when I'm sick. But it's not the same. Sabine's mom walks home with her after school every day. I watch the backs of them as they walk down the road, Sabine's mother's hip swaying, her hand in Sabine's, while Sabine tells her everything about her day. What would your hand feel like holding mine? I talk to your picture and you watch me with your eyes. When I ask you if you can see us from somewhere, if you think Emil is smart or if I'll be able to talk in front of other people someday, your eyes say yes to it all. Love, Nisha. That one makes me really sad. Okay, page 23. July 21st, 1947. Dear Mama, Causey tells me stories about you once in a while. I hardly ask him to tell me about you, though, because I'm afraid that the stories might run out. I want to save them like a treat. This afternoon, I used his mortar and pestle to grind coriander seeds, first crushing them as hard as I could, then twisting the pestle in circles to flatten them and make them into a powder. As soon as they broke under the weight of the pestle, I smelled the warm, soapy scent of them. Causey chopped onions holding a wooden stick between his teeth so he wouldn't cry. I asked him if you liked to cook. Causey shook his head, taking the stick out of his mouth. She never set foot in the kitchen. She liked to paint. She, excuse me, she'd go off to the back of the house and paint and paint. She had to be reminded to eat. She was that sort, he said, and put the stick back in his mouth. Just like a meal, I thought, who always ate the bare minimum in a hurry, hardly tasting it, and then begged to be excused so he could go back to his drawings or watch the older boys in the neighborhood play cricket. I want to be like you, Mama, but I can't understand anyone who forgets about food. Causey took the stick out again. It's your Papa who likes to cook. That's where you get it from. My mouth dropped open. Papa doesn't even make his own tea, I thought. Before he hired me, he did the cooking for your mama. And when they had guests, they'd pretend she did the cooking. She'd even dip her fingers in the curry so her nails would be yellowed from the turmeric. I shook my head. I couldn't imagine any of it. Papa cooking? Papa pretending? Papa and mama pretending together here in this house? Your papa told me, Causey said, reading my mind. He moved on to a pile of green chilies, slicing them into tiny slivers. I still didn't believe him. I'm sure you liked to cook, Mama, even just a little bit. Why doesn't he hang up her paintings? I couldn't say this louder than a whisper. Oh, it blacked out again. I'm sorry. I knew Papa kept her paintings in the corner of his study behind a wooden rocking chair. Sometimes I'd sneak looks at them. Causey looked down at his cutting board. I think he feels sad when he looks at them. I nodded. They were very brave, you know, he told me. I, didn't, I don't know anyone who did what they did. I tilted my head and paid close attention. I could tell the way Causey's voice lowered. He wanted to tell me something important. Their families were completely against their marrying. Papa's old school friend, a Hindu priest, agreed to marry them in secret. When they first came here, they were ostracized from the community. Even though all kinds of people get along here, but marriage has always been different. 
He sliced a few more chilies, and I twisted and pressed the pestle into my coriander powder, even though it was fully crushed. I needed a cooking job, since the restaurant I worked at closed, he said, and paused his chopping again, holding the knife still above the sliced chilies. I asked at several restaurants and homes, but everyone seemed to have enough help. I was getting desperate, so I decided to knock on the door nobody wanted to knock on. Oh, excuse me. Your papa invited me in and had me cook alutiki, your mother's favorite dish. He presented it to your mama. She tasted it and her eyes lit up. I've been here ever since. Your papa is such a good doctor that he quickly earned the respect of his patients in Merprakas, and they began to be accepted in the community. Just as things were getting better, she was gone, your mama. Only three years after they came here, Kazi looked down and cleared his throat. I took in Kazi's words, let them dance and twirl in my head, replayed them over and over like a beautiful piece of music. I can't stop thinking about it. Papa having secrets with you? Papa cooking before Kazi came? You and Papa marrying against everyone's wishes? In secret? What would it have been like if you'd lived, Mama? These things Kazi tells me are the memories I was supposed to have. They explode in my mind like firecrackers. Love, Misha. Okay, that is the end of our first reading section. If you have questions, please email me and I will respond to them as quickly as I can. Good night. I don't know how to pause this.